Pythagoras from faculty of Thank you so much. We can start the session. I want to have a welcome to Professor Kavira. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation as a keynote speaker and guest of honor at the seventh International Conference of Functional Automation and Instrumentation. Uh, be sure that your valuable speech as a well-known professor with years of research and depth of knowledge in this field can strengthen our conference uh, in spite of this virtual corona-affected work. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I think Professor Tahirat is so well-known and don't need to give a short biography, <laughs> but uh, uh, actually his main research is one of the well-known professors of the country. His main research is robots and non-unit control applied to robotic systems and one of the most uh, uh, advanced uh, robotic uh, uh, research uh, groups in the country, Aras. Of course, Aras, Dr. Sahirat, is, is the name of a river, famous river, near the Tabri. Yes, <laughs> that's the name of your group is similar to that. Thank you so much uh, for, uh, for your attendance in this conference. We are with you and with your valuable presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, if you have my voice quite, quite clearly, uh, I would like to thank all the organizers. I know that uh, during the conference you have a very, very hectic time, you know, arranging everything. So. Uh, without any further uh, delay, I would like to start my talk, which is basically on uh, artificial intelligence in autonomous and surgical robotics. Uh, our group uh, is named ARAS. ARAS is an acronym of a Advanced Robotic and Automated System. And as Dr. Garifer uh, told us, this is the name of a, a river in Iran, which uh, we, uh, we are very beloved Iran, that uh, we have the name uh, used uh, to do that. So, so in so this uh, presentation, I will go through a very sh short and brief introduction about uh, AI concepts. And then uh, I will divide my speech into uh, two different categories of our research, which is one of them is in autonomous robotics. And then the second is in the surgical robotics, uh, especially for intraocular or eye surgeries. And then I will, uh, uh, furthermore, I will introduce uh, one of our development, our research development for eye surgery training system which is also called Arash Assist, and uh, Arash is also a very famous Iranian name, and uh, we uh, have paired our product with this uh, system. Arash Assist is also an acronym for Aras Haptic System for Eye Surgery Training. And then I will conclude my talk with some uh, future prospect uh, on mixed reality and AI in surgery training. <clears throat> Uh, just a very short uh, introduction on ARAS. Uh, our group uh, uh, has been originated in 1997, and we are proud of uh, it's more than 23 years, we can say, of brilliant back, uh, background and contribution to the advancement of academic education and research in the field of robotics. Recently, we are uh, providing a number of uh, webinars, uh, very general audience uh, webinars, and also uh, uh, workshops and uh, speeches uh, to further develop the uh, knowledge and information and technology of robotics to a more common uh, audience. Our research group uh, currently are divided into five different categories. Uh, most of them are related somehow uh, in terms of application related to the robotics, uh, but in terms of the theory behind them goes through different areas of a robotic system. Uh, one of our first group, uh, which is quite uh, rather old, more than 15 years, we have uh, experience in the design of parallel and cable robotics. Uh, which are the new generation of robots uh, in terms of <clears throat> uh, automation systems. Uh, we don't have time to uh, cover the uh, product that we have produced in this research group. The second and third one is autonomous robotic and surgical robotic system, which we will talk uh, a few words about them uh, in this uh, speech. 
And then we have also a mixed reality in eye surgery system, uh, which is a, a multidisciplinary area of uh, embedding AI into our surgical training system. Uh, this could be used as the, uh, another uh, part of uh, our topic. And the underlying cornerstone of all everything uh, being done in our research group is pure uh, theoretical research in terms of dynamical system analysis and control, uh, which many of uh, our students are involved in. So let me start very easily with some uh, simple uh, question. And I apologize for the technical people who are attending in the seminar. Uh, we would like to uh, uh, talk about uh, uh, some common task in image processing and how image pro processing has been evolved. And then we will use uh, why we are using the uh, state-of-the-art uh, approach in our group uh, for some robotic application. Uh, usually, if you have an image, a digital image, uh, the classification is uh, something very important. Uh, what you see in an image, as you see in the, as you see in this uh, picture, is a cat. And uh, we should find a way to find this classification. The second stage would be uh, not only classifying this, also localizing it. Where in the space or in the image space uh, this feature is existent. Uh, later after that, we have many, many objects in an image. So we have object detection as well, uh, being considered as one of the main uh, research areas that uh, we should uh, think of it. Different objects in, a, in, a, in an image and how to differentiate between them. Uh, of course, there are a lot of more to, to talk about it, but I would like to add only one more. Uh, item here, which is segmentation, that uh, we can uh, basically the segment uh, the image from uh, for different objects. And in this segmentation, we have some sort of semantic segment segmentation, which is some sort of conceptual segmentation of the object that we are using in our uh, uh, research history. Uh, so how this has been evolved, uh, we can see in the, uh, basically in the uh, literature and in the evo uh, evolution of uh, image processing uh, methods, there are two main approaches. Uh, I can say one of them is more classical, uh, which is image processing based and uh, feature detection and uh, some sort of uh, doing it in that way. Uh, and the new version or the state-of-the-art uh, application that we are using is basically uh, on artificial intelligence. And in terms of intelligence, I have only two slides or two, three slides to give the broad uh, overview of that. A single simple neural network, as you see in this uh, figure, uh, can uh, be used for uh, basically uh, finding the classification of different uh, numbers. This is the most simplest, maybe, uh, image-based uh, processing that uh, with a neural network with a number of uh, hidden layers, we can uh, distinguish between different numbers from a picture. And as you see, uh, uh, tuning the gains of an uh, artificial neural network by uh, a, a subset of uh, images can provide us with uh, very good intuition. But if the image becomes harder and much more complicated, a simple neural network might be not usable. Today, uh, convolutional neural networks and deep learning methods are very, very celebrated and very common. And uh, many of the students are uh, looking to work on this area. Uh, this uh, neural network has different complex, it has a more complex uh, structure, and they have a lot of more uh, intuition and in hidden layers and uh, convolutional layers. Uh, that can provide, uh, they don't need to uh, basically differentiate between the, uh, the features that we are using. It can, uh, uh, it can do the classification, as you see here, uh, quite naturally, sorry, uh, through finding their own uh, 
features and finding the numbers. As you see here, uh, different layers can uh, distinguish between uh, some more, some important feature which is uh, basically trained by itself. And we can see that this convolutional neural network uh, brings us the, the future of the technology to more artificial intelligence. Uh, this CNN are used uh, in uh, many, many areas of research and uh, especially for data driven. We are focusing on uh, image based uh, uh, application. And as you see, this is the underlying co concept in the CNN. We have uh, some sort of convolutional uh, uh, arithmetic here between different layers. And uh, the most important thing is that we have a lot of a number of layers. Uh, it could be more than 100 layers to extract different features of the system. And, uh, and uh, that's why we can uh, distinguish quite well. And the necessary for uh, using such a uh, convolution, convolutional neural networks is the a rich data set and uh, using a deep learning methods. And maybe a few years ago, it was not very easy to find a large number of uh, images from different objects for classification purposes uh, to uh, train that. And also in terms of uh, uh, hardware that we require, we need uh, not only the CPU, we need some uh, sophisticated GPUs to do that. And since now we are in the uh, area of big data and uh, with this kind of uh, social networks and uh, uh, interrelating uh, so many images and uh, speech and so many data in the, in the cloud, uh, we can have access to this uh, in the large number of images, maybe in many, many areas of uh, application that we are using. Of course, uh, our application is mostly related to the robotic and surgical application, but this can be found in uh, many, many other applications. And, uh, very large companies like Google, Apple, uh, Microsoft, and uh, NVIDIA, and many, many uh, Tesla uh, are uh, basically developing both the hardware and the software that uh, can be used for our system. But uh, suppose, uh, you know, we have always this problem that uh, no pain, no gain. This, when we are talking about deep learning and also uh, about uh, how uh, this convolutional neural network has been changing the, uh, the trend of uh, what we are doing in our research, uh, we shouldn't forget that they, had, they, had, they are related to two main, uh, very main concept, which are uh, limiting uh, concept. First, we need a lot of number of uh, data set or images or uh, data to be analyzed. And then we need a long uh, trend of training uh, and the way the training should be considered, which are the state of the art that the researchers are working on. So usually we see only the uh, the final solution, and that's why how uh, we treat we think that it is uh, much more simpler to do it in the in this term rather than in the classical way. But uh, the important thing is uh, all the techniques can be used in their own place if they are uh, correctly selected. <clears throat> okay, that's enough for our uh, uh, in uh, introduction since we have a limited time. I will go through, uh, right away, go through the, the different application that we are using based on these uh, areas. And I try to uh, bring as much as possible the application that we are using to uh, have a, a large number of, uh, broad uh, number of audience uh, in our uh, uh, speech. Uh, one of the, maybe one of the first uh, approaches and that we have used the deep learning and uh, convolutional neural network in uh, is in basically in uh, images that are related to surgeries since we are working on eye surgery a lot, I will discuss about that. Uh, it is quite uh, natural to find uh, different uh, to segment or to classify or to diagnose even uh, different uh, patients uh, just by uh, true uh, optical images that we can get. This is an image that you can see for uh, vitrectomy 
uh, surgery. Uh, I will discuss about it a bit, a bit few, uh, in future. But uh, in here, what we are seeing is uh, just uh, doing the same classification and localization through deep learning data and getting uh, quite uh, accurate result if uh, uh, considering that we have uh, quite enough uh, data set, enriched uh, data set from uh, the surgeries that uh, hopefully we have. If you find some bony landmarks, we can find the skeleton of the system. We can train the system to find a a skeleton model, very simple skeleton model of the uh, of, uh, person, and then we can find very good uh, application, very useful application in industry, gender identification and recognition, or finding if there is uh, some problem in the terms of running and walking, in terms of uh, if there are some diagnostic uh, on the walking and running. And most uh, recently, we are working on human parsing Human parsing gives you uh, some sort of finding the behavior a man or a woman is doing in uh, running or walking or lying. And we can segment the uh, different behaviors of the system and we can find the fault, detect uh, fault detective uh, system to find uh, in dangerous spaces, especially in oil and gas industries. We can find how the uh, the people can uh, behave. This can be used in very um, in many many applications in terms of surveillance of uh, human behavior uh, in airports and in uh, special uh, location. <clears throat> Another uh, line of our research is depth estimation, and this is very important. I would like to talk a, a few more uh, technical words in here. Uh, I uh, hesitate to say much more technical. I would like to give a broader uh, area of uh, application uh, since this is a keynote speech and uh, would like to have a more general audience to be uh, attending uh, to, this com uh, to this session. Uh, but uh, some few technical details in this uh, picture, as you see, uh, if you have a monocolor camera, if you have one single camera, uh, then we lose the third dimension of the image, which is the depth. As you see, we have a, a depth image here, which is usually also uh, uh, portrayed in our eye. Uh, but in an image, in a single image that you see, uh, we don't uh, have the depth. And there are many, many techniques to find the depth from, uh, for, from a single uh, model of the camera. It needs the calibration process. It has a, a rich area of uh, research uh, in terms of calibration, modeling of uh, the camera, pinhole camera, and so forth and so on. But usually, uh, in our research group, we have used two different methods. Um, one is more classical, and the, the second one is uh, more artificial intelligent based to find the depth and to make some uh, more adjustment to the accuracy of the depth that we can find. And this was because of we, we have two different kinds of application, to industrial application, uh, referred to our group that we should handle them. Uh, so uh, the first one is done by an SFM with nonlinear observer. I discuss about uh, structural from motion and nonlinear observer in the workshop that has been uh, delivered two days ago in the same uh, conference. Uh, and there are the details of uh, how to design a nonlinear observer and uh, the finding the structure of the motion uh, just by uh, a number of uh, sequence of images is given. And this is the first method. I will give a few words on that. And then also we have the depth, depth estimation uh, to do with a fully end-to-end uh, -end depth estimator through CNN, that uh, we call it a CNN-based depth estimator uh, that we propose with semantic segmentation. In the next two slides, I will give the overview of them. The first one is 
a combination of, uh, let's say, some sort of uh, CNN uh, structure. We have a YOLO CNN for object detection. The application we are using uh, the, is available uh, to us. For autonomous driving, we are uh, working on some uh, application in autonomous driving in Iran. And for autonomous driving, one of uh, most important uh, aspect is to find the object, the front view object, and to avoid uh, hitting them, and uh, to, uh, to design a, a good path to avoid uh, the obstacles of the object. And the object could be both moving or uh, stationary, and all of them should be considered in mind. Uh, so with this YOLO CNN, which is a well-developed uh, uh, neural network, a uh, convolutional neural network, uh, to uh, classify more than 140 <clears throat> different objects, we can use it uh, quite naturally uh, to find different objects like bicycles, pedestrians, or different cars and of course, uh, this should be. Uh, this is not only. Uh, it is not sufficient to do only the objection. We uh, to, to the to the uh, to do the object detect detection. We should also track the the, the object that is uh, approaching, and we should uh, somehow detect how they are coming to toward us. This has been done by basically a SFM model and a developed observation model. We are using a nonlinear observer here which is a switched SDR filter uh, that can uh, find uh, or predict uh, the, uh, the tracking uh, part of this application. Uh, so we can embed a, a multi-method uh, or translational method from uh, artificial intelligence and uh, usual nonlinear or uh, conventional method together to find uh, this uh, system that we're running. But the point uh, which is very important is, as you see, let me just uh, provide some uh, verification in uh, the Carla simulator. We find the depth estimation, as you see, uh, on the boxes that are uh, moving around uh, in this simulation. Uh, for uh, seeing that uh, some objects are moving and some cars are uh, providing with the system. Uh, the, the key point here is everything should be implemented on a real autonomous car, so everything should be real time. And uh, it is not uh, easy to do such a heavy uh, uh, calculations, uh, even in, uh, with very uh, high valued uh, uh, GPUs that are available now uh, in the market uh, to do both the uh, tracking and uh, the detection and the tracking uh, on a real-time implementation. So the implementation is uh, basically done real-time with a multi-thread implementation of the algorithm. The second method is somehow different, uh, and we are using some semantic segmentation. We would like to have it one-to-one, -one and uh, the whole, uh, uh, basically, uh, convolutional neural network to find uh, both the uh, motion detection and the tracking in a, uh, with a artificial intelligence or depth estimation based on CNN uh, semantic segmentation. But, uh, we consider we had an idea to how uh, uh, our eyes or our conceptual system is doing. Usually, when we see, a, see an object, uh, we have a concept of the object. If the object is a car, we have some sort of uh, intuition how big and how large is a car. It could be a truck, or it could be a person, or it could be a kid. Semantic segmentation is, you know, differentiating between these, not only uh, having maybe a number of uh, classification objects, uh, knowing how, how many of them are more important, how many of them should be considered in our uh, analysis on, and, and what the, about the other one, especially when you have an image, there are uh, a lot of other things like uh, trees, the background, the sky, everything is in this image. And we should pick uh, the important object, especially the moving object that are uh, tracking toward us. 
Segmentation, semantic segmentation can be used in this. You can see in this, this image, a simple image you have, and we have a, a, a semantic segmentation using uh, neural networks or uh, convolutional neural networks. As you see, with the, quite a good accuracy, the red uh, part of the image uh, is uh, semantically segmented as a person. And the purse uh, is, you know, as you see here in purple, the plants uh, and other things are, the grass plants are in red. The sidewalk uh, is also sem semantically segmented by a uh, uh, gray line. And the building structure, then maybe the sky and every other things can be uh, segmented here in this way. The idea of uh, having semantic labels will could help us to get uh, better intuition in terms of uh, the estimation. Here uh, you see a, a semantic segmentation of uh, traffic flow. As you see different colors here, as you see the, uh, the green ones are, you know, grass, the uh, gray one are the sidewalks, and uh, the purple one are the uh, the road and also the cars with different cars. We have also the uh, light, uh, the red light, and also many, many uh, other issues like buildings and everything in this semantic segmentation. And can we use this semantic segmentation in depth estimation? Uh, we have proven that, or we have verified that we can do that. The, uh, the concept is that uh, not only to use an image to directly uh, find a depth, uh, basically first uh, put it into some seg uh, semantic segmentation as we see here with different colors, you know, like bicycle, persons, uh, grass, and also sidewalks, and then uh, integrate both of this information together as we think that our eyes are doing that. Uh, to find a depth map of the system. As you see, that the, the things that are closer are darker, and that the things that are farther are lighter in this picture. And the, uh, the color image that, or the grayscale image that we can see here can provide us with the depth map. Here we are considering only the depth, but con uh, note that this depth can be used in our uh, further application in uh, autonomous driving. Uh, what we have uh, proposed uh, is uh, basically to have two uh, convolutional neural networks, which is uh, uh, designed or custom designed uh, for this case. The, uh, the first uh, CNN, as you see, a number of uh, different number of uh, layers you can see here. I can go. I can't go through the detail of how we can design that, but just uh, consider that a new CNN structure can be developed to estimate the depth uh, directly just from, from the first image. So we are doing our best to find the depth, but not with a very large and heavy, although it is, as you see, there are many layers here, but comparing to the depth estimation, uh, state-of-the-art convolution and neural network, this is much, much uh, simpler and uh, uh, quite, uh, in terms of um, uh, the number of parameters, uh, smaller. Uh, but this is not the whole story. What we can do is uh, now we can go through the another part of it, which uh, is, as you see, which uh, we have uh, from an image, we can get a depth estimation, uh, initial depth estimation. Then we go through the second part. We use also the uh, semantic labels that we have here we put both of them together again in another structure, which is uh, somehow used the improved structure with semantic data. And uh, it gives us a, a hell of better, uh, let's say, uh, uh, structure that we can use. Uh, the, the projection the, and the structure, the, or the up sampling and the projection skip, uh, uh, the structure of the CNN are given here. The details you can find, uh, of course, in our papers, uh, how we can uh, implement that. And this means that uh, having a semantic uh, uh, image in, as well as a, a regular image, we can put them together, concatenate, and put it in here. We can get a depth estimation, which is uh, much better in terms of uh, accuracy. 
Here is the uh, real-time uh, implementation. I should play all three by together. This is an image uh, that is taken from uh, a car. Basically, it is not in Iran, but we are using the database, <clears throat> both in Iran and also <clears throat> elsewhere. As you see here, we have <clears throat> the semantic uh, segmentation picture of this year. You know, the cars are in blue and the green, uh, the uh, green one or the grass. And uh, uh, we are re reducing the number of segmented uh, values to the, uh, the point that we can implement it in real time. And uh, at the uh, latter one, the la latest one, you can see what we have in terms of uh, the uh, depth that we can get. So if I uh, try to run them on almost the same as you see, it is running real time. It goes here, the semantic segmentation and the depth estimation. And as you see, the depths are getting quite well and with a very good accuracy. Uh, comparing to the state of the art depth estimation that we have, uh, we can go uh, further with this uh, formulation. Perfect. Uh, this is maybe one of the main results that can be used now in the second part of our uh, autonomous vehicle or autonomous uh, robotics applications. Uh, we are lucky enough to be uh, uh, involved in uh, the, the national uh, project that is being uh, run by uh, our car companies in autonomous vehicle design. Of course, we don't want a f uh, fully autonomous uh, vehicle, Iranian vehicle right now. We would like to have some driving aids uh, like braking and you know, autonomous braking and uh, avoiding uh, accidents and so forth and so on uh, in this uh, case. Here uh, you see uh, one of the results we have in terms of uh, towards, as I mentioned, for assistive driving system. Uh, we can have uh, the uh, uh, quite uh, implementable the object detection, uh, localization, and depth estimation all being done here, not only for the cars, let me run it again, you can go with the different uh, objects that are around here. You can see bicycles and also pedestrian. Everything can be done in here. This system has employed the state-of-the-art deep learning approaches for object detection and tracking both uh, all together and also uh, developed to track, uh, detect and track any frontal object in an autonomous vehicle. And the, uh, the algorithm is implemented in a Jepson TX2 and AGX Javier board by using TensorRT for optimization. The system performs real time. <clears throat> and this is very, very interesting. You know, to recognize the exact speed limitation, a lean-net classifier is employed after the traffic sign detection. Actually, the traffic sign detection is uh, somehow become uh, extra to make the, uh, the uh, CNNs uh, small enough to be uh, possible to implement. One of other uh, application of the same uh, industrial project which I called here is with SIPA uh, is uh, the same thing, uh, finding the object in front row. Uh, we have uh, finalized this project hopefully uh, last year. And uh, what we are doing here, again, we are uh, having, <clears throat> we are equipping one of the uh, national cars uh, which is uh, developed in SIPA. Uh, for with such a system. Uh, the, this car is equipped with uh, a, a Basler camera, uh, industrial camera, plus a Jepson TX2 uh, GPU for uh, the computational that we would like to do. Uh, we have the longitudinal and the lateral distance estimation. We need to the estimation. This car has also the radar. Of course, not all the cars uh, the, in Iran have radars, but we have used the radar to implement uh, and to verify how we can find the longitudinal and lateral distances. Uh, here is a picture from uh, the, the parking lot of uh, the SIPA research group that uh, this uh, system is working. Basically, uh, the car will be start uh, finding the object, the important object as you see, and also to estimate the uh, the frontal uh, uh, 
distance between them. And then uh, yeah. uh, going through a different uh, approach, we can have a performance up to 70 frames per second, uh, which can be implemented in real time. Uh, one other uh, industrial project in the same line uh, is for uh, tracking people, not just the cars and frontal view. We have uh, developed an ARAS tracker, which is the CNN-based object tracker. And you see in a coronavirus uh, area that you, that you like to predict uh, how the people can uh, walk around. Uh, it has a very uh, in, uh, interesting feature in terms of the tracking. Uh, usually the trackers can lose uh, what they are tracking. And this tracker, which is basically a flexible CNN structure with multiple input branches, uh, can find uh, the, uh, first of all, find the size of the object that is tracking. And it can be uh, tracking uh, almost everything, I can say that very, very small objects to uh, very large objects and uh, very fast object like airplane uh, to very slow moving object like what you are seeing in this picture. This has been performed with 50 frames per second speed uh, that uh, with a bit uh, better uh, hardware we can uh, speed the, the rise time to 120 frames per second for this kind of tracker. So I conclude my part uh, on the autonomous robotic here. If there is any questions up to here, I would uh, be happy to uh, have your uh, questions. Uh, and if you don't, uh, if you don't mind, I can go through the second part of my uh, case, which are on surgeries and on intraocular surgery in robotics. Uh, what we go in the surgery is basically we have uh, different uh, themes about what you can say. Let's, say let's talk a bit about uh, eye surgeries. We have two types of eye surgeries. Both are being done uh, minimal invasive surgeries with very, very small incision in the eyes and then uh, using uh, the uh, cutting tools or the vitrectomy tools uh, through the eye. They're called cataract and vitrectomy. If you don't mind, I show you a, a part of a, a image of a true uh, uh, cataract surgery, which we call it here capsule rex. It's a part of uh, cataract surgery, which is uh, done on the frontal uh, part of the eye. And everything is being done now by uh, very, very uh, uh, skilled professional surgeons, uh, ophthalmologists. Since we don't have that much time, let me also go to the, the second part of the injury. As you see, this was the frontal part of the eye. The uh, vitrectomy goes inside the eye, and uh, it's uh, for more the sophisticated, uh, uh, basically, uh, uh, eye surgeries that are within the eye if there are some problems uh, on the retina and on the uh, on the internal part of the eyes, uh, this surgery is, is being used. And we have uh, the very large number of cataract surgery, surgery and uh, unfortunately also a uh, large number of uh, vitrectomy uh, infections that uh, requires a very high skilled surgeon to do that. As you see, uh, the, the eye surgery, the eye is a very delicate organ, and the eye surgery is in the, uh, the accuracy of uh, almost uh, uh, one tenth of a mi uh, millimeter or 100 micro. How robotic can uh, help this kind of surgery? Uh, one of the uh, helps is to just uh, reduce the tremor of the hand tremor of the eye surgery by handheld apparatus. Some other part is uh, doing all the surgery uh, with a with a robot, with an autonomous robot, and maybe a middle way is using a robot, but with a telesurgery or teleoperator. The surgeon uh, works on a, a haptic device, and then we have. Uh, the, to, to perform the surgery on the, uh, on the eye by itself. I provide some uh, very uh, uh, state-of-the-art uh, 
a robotic system that has been used uh, for this kind of uh, surgeries. This is the steady hand robot by Johns Hopkins in 2011, which is a handheld as uh, tools that can help this uh, both uh, for cataract and uh, vitrectomy. Uh, this is another one uh, which is called Precise, a robot by Eindhoven University. This, uh, this robot can uh, perform quite well. As you see, it was teleoperated, and it, is, uh, it will reduce the tremor of the uh, surgery surgeon uh, quite well. As you see here, the accuracy that the robot has and uh, a skilled uh, surgeon uh, still have some sort of tremor, as you see. Uh, compared to this uh, robot. This robot should have a remote center of motion because it is MICH comes from one single point to the eye. This is another robotic which is uh, a system that is uh, being developed in KU Logan uh, in 2017 and this is also used for uh, vitrectomy for intraocular surgeries as you see. Uh, this is also not clinically approved yet but as you see it is uh, used uh, in uh, many simulators uh, here, as you uh, can see in these uh, images. Uh, and uh, the last but not the least is our own surgery robot. We call it Diamond because it is like a diamond. It has a, an, an, uh, it has a parallel structure. It is a spherical robot that has the precision uh, to be used uh, in uh, intraocular surgery. This goes back to 2016, about five years ago, and we have uh, generated two uh, platforms of these surgeries. In at, the, at that time, uh, we go with uh, uh, a lot of uh, communications with our surgeries, with our surgeons and ophthalmologists, uh, to bring this uh, robotic manipulator into the surgery room. Uh, after two years of communication uh, with the network of ophthalmologists in uh, Tehran University of Medical Science and uh, Farabi Hospital, hospital, the most important hospital for eye surgery in Iran, uh, we find it that uh, still it is too soon to bring the robot into the surgery because usually the surgeons will think that if the robot comes into the surgery room, they should go out. Although there are all on robots are uh, telemanipulated and should be operated by a, uh, by a surgeon, uh, this could uh, cause a problem. And we were uh, not so su uh, successful, and uh, even our colleagues in uh, Canada and United States also uh, have the same problem. Uh, but uh, with these two years of communication, we find uh, another problem, which is called uh, we can bring the assistive, the robotics uh, assistive surgery to training systems. Let me, let me uh, define for you the RH assist, RS haptic system for eye surgery training, which is a developed uh, idea that is on top of the robotic system that we can use for surgery. The surgery training uh, have always been a challenging uh, issues to expert surgeon. You see, uh, with a, a so delicate operation with one tenth of uh, millimeters uh, motion, uh, suppose that you want to uh, train that to a, a novice surgeon, and this usually br uh, bring uh, the, uh, some complication. You know, the, the the student are doing a simple operation, but they may call. Uh, PCR, posterior capsule rapture for cataract surgery or retina puncture or vitrectomy surgery. If the, the touch, if the, the tool will touch uh, uh, unintentionally to the retina or will, uh, will uh, rapture the capsule, the posterior capsule, then uh, a very simple uh, uh, surgery will become a very, very difficult one, which we call the PCR one is the most difficult one uh, that you can see it will happen uh, for the expert surgeon. It can happen even for the expert surgeon, yeah, about 3%. Hopefully our uh, expert surgeon in Iran have less than 2% uh, PCR in the uh, statistic, but mm -hmm. for the novice surgeon we have about 11%. Uh, Is there any question or anything you can add? Now what we are uh, basically developing is instead of using a robotic system for doing the surgery using two haptic consoles for uh, training. Uh, this training 
uh, are uh, uh, focused for vitrectomy training. Uh, we, the system has basically two haptics for vitrectomy. We have a trainer and training in the system. We have collaborating training and or collaborating uh, implementation. Uh, the, the, how it, it is working is basically first, uh, in the first training step, the uh, trainer or the skill surgeon will do the training, uh, but as uh, he or she is doing, the tra is doing the operation, directly doing the operation, we have an haptic input interface, like consider a glove in his hand or in her hand, that we can measure the, uh, the motion of the hand, the delicate motion of the hand, and also the forces, and we can uh, replicate it into another uh, haptic device that uh, the novice uh, surgeon can feel and can uh, uh, learn how uh, the hand motion should be. In the next stage, now the, the change in uh, the role will be changed. We have two consoles. Now the novice one comes into the picture and do the surgeries. Uh, but uh, although, uh, com contrary to the uh, traditional way that the uh, skilled person cannot intervene into the system, since he has, uh, he or she has a, uh, basically a, uh, a glove or a haptic device, and if you can see that the, the problem comes uh, with the surgery, then it can intervene into the system. And after uh, the training is completed, then the trainer becomes a skilled trainer, and we can uh, perform many training to him uh, as well. This system has been implemented uh, in two versions. We call it Arash Assist 1, which is uh, used a parallelogram robotic system with a, a, a RCM structure, very, very easy uh, and very, very uh, uh, handy, let's say, with force feedback and uh, position feedback, we are using capstan drive for and cable robotics to uh, drive the system. Uh, and then we have the, the second version of it, which is an improved version with a larger workspace and dexterity. You can see the, some uh, movies of this RH Assist system. Uh, during the design and also in operation, as you see, we have two training and trainer system. Don't look at this kind of uh, lot of wires that we are having here. This is the, in the design, uh, not in the operating room. This is in our lab. And as you see, we can have a replication of uh, motion from the trainee to the trainer and vice versa. And we have also a pedal uh, to intervene, basically. As you see the intervene, you can put the, the pedal and get the, uh, the control of the training. Input. Here is the, uh, some uh, 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 movies uh, about the development of the system. This is Dr. Mohammadi, one of the uh, uh, very, very skilled ophthalmologists that has been helping us in this way in design. Uh, at the beginning, uh, with this case, uh, he uh, gave us very good feedback on how the, the problem of this is and the, the ergonomy of the system and also uh, the workspace that is required here. And then uh, this is the second version has been designed uh, again uh, in our lab and been uh, tested by Dr. Mohammadi. And then after uh, doing some uh, corrections, uh, here you can see also Dr. Ashwadizad, our partner, or collaborator from uh, Queen's University of Canada in this uh, project. And then uh, further to that, we have several different things in the skill lab uh, in Farabi Hospital, the different uh, surgeons, this is Dr. Riyazi, uh, performing some uh, 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 real operation of this system in the uh, skill lab and uh, also getting some feedback, uh, adjusting the system again. As you see, it's still uh, the system is open. We have both the uh, manipulators here or the haptic devices here. And uh, we had the, also the honor to uh, uh, have the collaboration with uh, uh, Professor Lashe, one of the uh, leading uh, ophthalmologists of Iranian uh, medical schools here. Uh, after that, he has also uh, given us uh, some uh, feedback to the system. This is Professor Nashi, and uh, he also provides some uh, 
vision to us. And finally, uh, we uh, had uh, uh, quite confident to uh, bring the system into a real uh, uh, operating uh, room and operating surgery. Of course, it needs some uh, ethical approval and uh, uh, that is being done right now. But here you can see the operation is being done on a real uh, eye bank, uh, on a real eye system, this uh, system. And uh, the haptic device has been approved its uh, ability to do that. So is everything finished? Dr. Ravifek, just tell me how much time do I have to manage for the rest of the talk? Okay. How much time do I have, Dr. Ravifek, to finalize my talk? Uh, actually, as you wish, Dr. Tarirat, our next session will be start at one of uh, oh, okay. I will. Yes. I will. I will complete it in ten minutes, if you don't mind. In ten minutes. Thank you so much. Okay. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, after everything is fin finished, now I would like to say a few words about artificial intelligence. Can we add some artificial intelligence to this highly technical robotic system that uh, we have in brought into uh, the surgical room? Yes, we can. We can have uh, mixed reality and AI added to the system. And to give the, uh, the, the questions, we have two haptic systems. The first haptic system, as you see, the, uh, the uh, uh, surgeon is doing the operation right on the uh, eyes of the patient. So he can see, he or she can see exactly what is going on. Could be a trainer or a trainee. But what about the second visual system? Usually, what we have right now, there are some monitors in the operating rooms that the second surgeon can see through this monitors and this is the least efficient way to see the uh, opera the operation and interfere with that one more option is double headed microscope as you see here and uh, there is some problem with you know as you see a, a, a microscope will uh, return the uh, the, uh, the uh, image, you know, left to right and right to left, it should uh, have some sort of uh, image correction to it. And also there should be quite close to each other. And then uh, one uh, trainer cannot work with the number of trainees as can be seen here. The third option which we are working right now on it is to have some headset and to have some visual headset uh, for the second uh, console to see the operation in an immersed version. Uh, so what you see here, we can combine the haptic console in eye surgery training with a uh, very simple Oculus system that can be used here. And here, the artificial intel intelligence come into the picture with a high depth of uh, information. Here, we can see that. Uh, let's just give you the story. The, what we can see is the patient eye is uh, obtained uh, the real eye data from the uh, images that we can get from the patient uh, from a complete set of scans. So we have a, a 3D model of the system that can be uh, basically personalized for one particular uh, patient. Then the trainer performs the surgery with the haptic console. That's all. What he's doing as before, but we are doing two things. First, uh, we're using the haptic device, so we measure the information, the kinematic information, the motion or force uh, information that the patient is doing, and we can capture the video from the real eye. And then we can mix them together with a virtual model of an eye, which is personalized for the system, and augment the virtual model to the real haptic system for the surgery. And then we can give this equipment to the uh, trainee. The trainee can see like 
getting more knowledge, bring it forward, coming backward, and also feel and work on what they can do in a virtual 3D and immersive uh, way that uh, a virtual uh, headset, virtual reality headset can provide. Right? <clears throat> But this is not only this, since we have a model and we have some information from the system, now we can use artificial intelligence uh, to track the motion of a, a very skilled trainee or a number of skilled trainees and uh, to put some more information on the video that the trainee is watching. Now that we have this, we can uh, guide him how to uh, get, get to the tools and, uh, and also give some intonation about the depth, which we talked about it before, and uh, not to capture, not to puncture the retina. And that's very, very important to avoid basically this kind of thing. So the, t the trainee uses its own tool and haptic information plus augmented reality. Uh, this is not only virtual because we have the tools and we have the uh, virtual reality uh, put together and we can have skill assessment and uh, develop training strategies. This is a hell of work here that we are uh, a group of us are doing. But our main and final uh, outcome, which, which come maybe in two, three years, uh, we are seeing it in before, that we have both these two haptic devices is working. The one haptic device is working on the real patient, and the second haptic device, which is the trainee or the trainer, can see uh, everything in a virtual model information. And then uh, what we can say, we can remove the uh, the uh, tools of the real surgeon from the haptic device one and provide the image of the uh, second tool for the trainee to do the real training prospect, not on a real environment for the second console, on a, a virtual environment. This is uh, becoming, uh, this is one of the very, very high class, first class research areas that uh, is being followed uh, in Iran and uh, uh, with the help of our international partners. How what we use, uh, and let me just show some uh, introductory or primary result that we have. We need the haptic device and we need also a simulator that we are using SOFA framework here and we need some immersive visualization like Unity or Unreal that is used in uh, 3D games and also we need some Oculus headset and uh, uh, basically uh, uh, some uh, application for that to uh, apply them all together. Uh, here you see what we are doing, the steps that should be done. <clears throat> for cataract surgery, we should have the model of the eye, put everything uh, in, in order and plus uh, we should have the force feedback uh, from the haptic device. We can have the top topology definition, the, we can have the collision uh, computation, especially the collision to the uh, retina and the capture, uh, and also we can have uh, force feedback. These are uh, the main uh, important parts that should be uh, done here. Uh, here you can see uh, maybe the one of the initial uh, models that we have developed for the eye. Of course, this is uh, very, very basic and primary at this stage, uh, and it is not uh, good looking, uh, but it will be good looking very shortly. Uh, you can see in the next slide. The only thing is that all the details uh, of the model, like the lens uh, or uh, different uh, part of the eye is uh, modeled in a dynamical way that we can uh, add more force and uh, measurement uh, to it. And uh, what we can basically run is uh, having uh, that model in so far to be uh, embedded together and we can uh, have some uh, virtual reality topology on top of that. Uh, this first uh, one goes to a better uh, scene, as you see. Uh, this uh, is taken maybe two months ago. As you see here, you know, now the uh, topological eyes uh, has um, the, a better structure. It is not still perfect, but we can have uh, the feeling of uh, cutting 
or puncturing the surface of the eyes and we can have the physical component of the eye in here. And uh, the, the next stage, uh, we can have some uh, phantom omni or, or RH assist haptic to be uh, embedding force on the real environment. And let's see here, we have the augmented reality. Uh, we work with uh, some uh, haptic device here, and as you see in, uh, in the real picture, you can uh, move the, uh, uh, the 3D model and you can feel the forces in this uh, haptic device. And uh, here also, uh, maybe a few, the final few videos that we are providing you for surgery training. Here you can see, if you have seen the uh, real vitrectomy uh, uh, surgery, uh, a few slides before, here we are uh, doing our best to replicate uh, the membrane clean, peeling, membrane extraction, and uh, so for scene uh, creation. This is much better from our uh, original uh, version of the simulators that we have, and uh, we hope that in uh, the next uh, conference, we can provide you with a, a better and complete version. Here you can see the lighting and also some uh, motion, the dynamics that we can have here, uh, the extraction of the membrane in a space that has been uh, gravity oriented. And this, this is becoming, we are working on the, uh, this area to uh, perform now. Uh, I would like to uh, conclude my talk uh, to the many, many uh, collaborators that we have, especially Nimad for uh, supporting us, uh, Kentucky University and Farabi Eye Hospital and Tehran University of Medical Science are the main uh, partners that uh, the contribution of their works. I am just presenting other people's work and I'm very happy to be part of this uh, uh, very large group. Of course, uh, uh, also we have the University of Alberta and Queens and also and other uh, also partners that are being uh, helping us. Very many people have been working here, a number of them you can see, I don't go through the names. And here are the ophthalmologists and also the uh, practitioners that we are doing with Farabi Hospital. Uh, thank you very much uh, for bearing me and uh, I hope that I was not too long and not too disturbing for you. Please visit our website and we would be very happy to have uh, any uh, questions and any collaboration with uh, our uh, respected audience. Thank you so much, dear Professor Arirat, for your meaningful and constructive speech. Uh, it's so instructive for myself because I, but, uh, but I am somehow busy. I record your video and I watch <laughs> the game with more concentrate because it has uh, lots of details that are really instructive for our team that's working on surgical robot and telesurgery systems. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Tahira, uh, can we share your files and video with other participants? Yes, actually I have already done that. Uh, I have put uh, the videos in my research gate. It is now public. I will give it to you. Uh, the, the link that you can uh, get access to, give access to everybody. Thank you so much. Well, we are with the participants for any possible questions and other remarks, please. You can ask your questions. You can raise your hand and we will activate your microphone. There is any question? Uh, hi, Professor. Can you hear me? Yes, yes of course. Uh, I'm Amir from MUT. First, I want to express my gratitude for your great presentation. And I have uh, one question about first part of the presentation. Uh, we built a, a neural network model, but we don't have how they work, especially when we have a uh, lots of hidden layers. So how can we trust DNNs 
to make correct decision or correct driving? Very, very good question. <laughs> uh, if you don't mind, I give a bit of introduction to that. I, I like this kind of question to give more information to you. Uh, nowadays, uh, CNN and I, I appreciate if everybody could, uh, you know, just mute because, uh, yeah. Uh, CNN and uh, artificial intelligence is becoming very popular, and everyone wants to work on it. But uh, there is two important uh, limitation here, as uh, Amir told us. One of them is uh, the analytical uh, understanding of what is being done in CNNs. Uh, I don't say that there is no knowledge about it, but uh, really what it, it what is going on in a very large network, uh, it is very, very difficult to understand. The only thing that we can understand is each layer, how different each layer can work and how, which feature it is working on. Uh, and uh, there are a lot of research being done uh, to distinguish between, uh, you know, different aware, uh, different uh, uh, approaches, bringing attention to the uh, uh, system, providing, uh, you know, some sort of capsule orientation uh, methods that are uh, focusing on a particular case to, uh, like a focusing or attention base to do that. But Still, we are at the very early stage of, although this is quite rich in terms of application, and it is quite promising uh, to be used uh, for that, but uh, only very, very few, very, very few people in the world uh, are aware of that. And I uh, provide uh, all the uh, very good, talented uh, students uh, from our university uh, not to be only an operator of CNN or uh, 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 deep learning methods uh, product, uh, to work on the structures. Uh, we in our group, uh, uh, basically we have done more than 15 years of uh, conventional uh, autonomous robotic approach, which are based on Bayesian approach, which are totally analytical, and we can have all the proofs there, but they are very difficult to uh, do an end-to-end procedure. Uh, what uh, artificial intelligence or a CNN can do is an end-to-end, but we don't know. Still, not me, can say the whole community are still seeking how this is being done uh, with, this, uh, with this CNN. So to answer your question, how we can see if it is right or wrong, usually there are some measures like ROA measures, some uh, error measurement, some RMS measurement, depending on what you are doing. If you are finding a depth, then you can have some sort of extra uh, measurement to find if the, the system is doing well or not. But if it is not doing well, uh, how to correct it and how to change it uh, it takes uh, a lot of time, and uh, I'm proud to be part of a group of uh, very talented students that they have the, uh, I can say, the, uh, uh, the uh, um, not the knowledge, but uh, 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 the, to have the shujo ata anjom in I cannot say it in, because it is a very difficult uh, task. But, but you know, uh, after a year or two working with uh, CNN, uh, you can get familiar how they they are globally working, not uh, exactly. How they are. Thank you, Amir, for your good question. I I, uh, I hope that I have answered your question, but. If there is any more comment, please add to this. Uh, thank you, Professor. I understand. And again, a special thanks for your great presentation. You're welcome. Thank you for being with us. OK. Any other question? Uh, 
Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yes, please. Uh, yes, thanks for your presentation. Uh, I have some questions. Uh, my Thank number one question, how I, and to what I, extent... Would you please uh, introduce yourself so that I can answer your question uh, in more detail, if possible. Yes, I am a MSc student at Sheriff University uh, and uh, my field is uh, structural engineering, uh, but interested in uh, artificial intelligence and neural networks uh, and machine learning. Perfect. Please. Uh, can I ask my questions? Yes, sure. Uh, yes. Uh, my first question is about uh, how and to what extent uh, light intensity affects the results. Uh, for example, uh, for the images taken in night and uh, or uh, during the day. Uh, and uh, my second question is about uh, what uh, what you propose uh, to pursue more in this uh, digital and uh, machine learning artificial intelligence area. For example. Uh, but you propose us to uh, pursue uh, more machine learning, machine vision, uh, or deep learning. Uh, and my third uh, question is about, uh, besides the advantage, advantages of uh, AI in surgery applications, and what are the disadvantages or dangers that we may face with? Perfect. Very good questions. Uh, I got it uh, a bit uh, hard because, because your voice was uh, somehow uh, interrupting. But your first question was, uh, if you <laughs> remind me, <laughs> your first question was about, uh, uh, can you tell me what was your first question? <laughs> Just the topic. The second one was about detail, and the, the yes. third one about the images, but the first one was about... Uh, the light intensity, for example, oh, images yeah. taken in night yeah. or day. It's quite simple. Uh, you know, light intensity is very important in uh, uh, classical method. When you have classical method, when you are doing, for example, uh, uh, classification with classical image processing method, then light intensity is very, very important. Of course, in uh, deep uh, learning approaches, this is also important, but what we do, uh, since we have a, a large number of data sets, a large number of uh, images in our data set, uh, we should include the light intensity, different light intensity in our uh, data set. So if our data set is equipped with uh, images that has different light intensity in it, then they can perform quite well. But if they are not, we can artificially change the light. It is, uh, it is quite possible to, you know, to remove, the, to enlighten, or to darken the, the images or the uh, pictures or the, that, that we have, and then uh, use them in the trainings. But it is a hell of the work, and that's why uh, it is important. Uh, in deep learning methods, we don't uh, really uh, worry about uh, uh, having such uh, particular cases because uh, usually we uh, we have that we should take in that into account in our uh, training stage, and at that stage we need a lot of uh, a lot of uh, images. When we, when I say a lot of image. It means that less than 5,000 images is nothing, you know, for doing something like that. The second part was, uh, your question was about, uh, uh, can you again remind me about that? I'm getting a bit old now. Uh, yes. 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 I mean, uh, what you propose us to pursue more, uh, machine vision, machine learning, or deep learning? Uh, this is, uh, I cannot answer to that, because uh, depending on uh, what you are interested in, <laughs> uh, they're all uh, uh, collaborated or uh, 
collocated to each other. They are quite uh, uh, very interleaving uh, approaches that you are using. Uh, what I can say, there is a, a uh, standard method to enter to, in, to a deep learning method. If you don't have the background knowledge of image processing or uh, image distribution, something that as you uh, questioned the first one, it is not good to directly go through the deep learning. And, uh, and also uh, make sure that uh, I talked about uh, the application, image-based application of deep learning. This is not the only uh, way of application to do that. Uh, what I suggest is not to what to do. Uh, each either way that you want, uh, you are interested or you have an uh, application or you have a uh, product or a contract or something to solve with, uh, you should work on this. But uh, the way you are doing that is important. Again, I will uh, strongly suggest uh, the, the audience not to uh, be only an operator of uh, uh, developed uh, technique or technology. You should get into the technology. You should get, you should, you know, be in, you should uh, just swim in this cold water uh, to become uh, uh, somehow eligible to contribute in it. If you are going doing only image processing, which is a large area of uh, research, still large area of research, uh, it is more conventional, it is more deterministic rather than the artificial intelligence base. Uh, you, you should be uh, more in depth of it. Just uh, learn how to get uh, more depth information about uh, this area. And then you can go to another stage. Uh, and for deep learning, as the first uh, question was uh, given, uh, there are uh, still a very large area of not understanding what is going uh, on uh, in these systems. And there are a very, very hard time for uh, the researchers uh, to do uh, what is what you have seen in our in our movies or in our research. This is the final result uh, that has been done after one year or one and a half year of hard work and uh, difficulties and challenges that have been solved uh, for the question. Thank you very much for your kind ask. Is there is there any anything that I can add? Uh, please let me know. Uh, thank you for your explanations. Uh, and my last question is about the advantages or dangers uh, we may face with uh, regarding uh, surgical applications. Yes, actually, for, especially for uh, surgeries, when, when you have an application that is working with a human being, uh, this would be uh, quite uh, quite uh, delicate and you should be uh, very confident about the system. Uh, in our classical approach, we have the stability proofs. We, have, we are sure that everything is converging and uh, we are sure that uh, nothing will really happen. But uh, in uh, this artificial intelligence uh, uh, approaches, the best and the state of the art and the best approaches you can find for a very simple particular case gives you maybe 99% of uh, approval. And it, there is always 1% of, uh, you know, uh, not doing well. Uh, so uh, there, there are endangers, and usually uh, we should, uh, what I can say, uh, usually these are assistive uh, methods. We, are, we, we should use uh, real artificial intelligence, not, uh, not real intelligence, the human intelligence, to be added to the uh, systems that are of uh, particular interest. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Dear Professor Tahirat, as we are going to start other keynote speech at 1 o'clock, 
uh, if uh, you met and other participants, uh, maybe uh, other participants have questions. Uh, can they uh, share their questions via email with you? Sure, of course. Uh, just uh, ch search through the email. I, uh, our group is called Aras. You can just check the Aras, the uh, very beloved uh, uh, Aras River of our country. That we are uh, very proud of it, and uh, it would be always part of uh, our beloved country, Iran, like Persian Gulf, which is always being Persian Gulf. Uh, just look at Aras and Tagirad. You can find easily my uh, details. I would be more than happy to contact uh, to have uh, more to give more information. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. I want to give.